Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Very glad to be here with you on April 16th, 2024. It's been a little while. Um, very glad to be back here with you on this occasion. Um, on my website over at richarddolanmembers.com, I'm very active there. I've got a, a remarkable, amazing group of members of that site. Uh, I swear some of the, the most uh, insightful folks around they hang out there, and uh, I'm much luckier for it. I can say that because I get to bounce all kinds of ideas off the members of the site. We go back and forth, and I, I really learn from them. Um, and uh, of late, there was a couple of uh, folks who were expressing a kind of disclosure fatigue, uh, UAP disclosure fatigue, and I, I kind of get it. Uh, I, you know, there's this, uh, and it's even, it goes beyond folks in my website. I mean, you can see this in the UFO UAP community. Uh, people want congressional hearings. We want to get the truth from the government about UFOs, UAP, anything that's going on. Uh, of course, keep in mind, this is an old refrain. We, you know, this isn't just in the last few years that the public has wanted the truth on UFOs. This is, goes back to the 1950s, 1940s as a matter of fact. And so I always like to say, don't hold your breath waiting for uh, an unvarnished, transparent, there's the word they like to use these days, transparent truth coming out about this. Could happen. It would be a good thing. But there are many reasons to study the UFO subject beyond disclosure. I've just got a list of a few of them here. I'm going to be coming back to this uh, for a future presentation. It occurs to me this is important. Uh, I'll just very briefly, these are some reasons that I'm thinking of. You've got the complexity and depth of the phenomenon itself. I mean, my God, it's why else are we here? We didn't all come here because we thought, oh, geez, there's going to be disclosure. We all got into the UFO subject because let's face it, it's a fascinating subject. We've all encountered UFO stories that don't make sense, but that seem credible. And so it's a mystery. It's something we want to know about. Uh, there are scientific technological implications, obviously. There's the whole uh, question of consciousness. I mean, how many times have we heard of people having a mental connection in one form or another with these beings? Uh, and the whole connection to human evolution. Did they tweak us? Have they monitored us? Did they watch us? What's our trajectory? Are they following that whole thing. You know, all of those questions are uh, just fascinating. Uh, the whole global impact of this phenomenon, any role that this phenomenon has played in societal change. There have been lots of theories about this <clears throat> from Jacques Vallée almost 50 years ago writing about this, and many, many other folks have discussed this. Uh, people have had personal experiences, personal encounters, whether traumatic or whether revelatory and empowering, whatever. Uh, these are important on an emotional, uh, deep, deep level for so many people. I'm sure many of you listening know exactly what I'm talking about. There's historical significance to this phenomenon. There's cultural significance to this phenomenon. I've spent basically my whole adult life studying those things. Uh, all centered around the possibility, let us say, likelihood of non-human intelligences that are here with us on this planet of ours yeah, I think that's kind of important, kind of interesting. So uh, there's a lot of reasons to stay with this subject, whether or not we get the immediate satisfaction of congressional hearings, UAP disclosure, President Biden going up to the podium and saying, yeah, come on, man, it's real. Well, whatever. We don't <laughs> we're, we're we can wait for those things. We can cross our fingers and hope for those things. But the fact is that the phenomenon is what pulls us in regardless of what the government does when they want to come down from on high and say, we're going to give you the truth. Well, what we really want, the reason we want disclosure isn't so that the government can give us the truth. That's not why we want this, okay? We want this because the government's job is not to spoon feed you BS like your five-year-old child for the rest of your life. The government's job is to respond to you, the citizen. That is why. That is the number one reason why. The truth, we can figure out a lot of that on our own. We're going to be talking about that here today, as a matter of fact. Um, there may be secrets buried within the black budget world. I have no doubt that that is the case, and we can benefit from learning some of those. Yes, 
But we want disclosure, not because we want the government to hand us the truth, because they're not going to hand us the truth. The likelihood is they're going to hand us more spin, disinformation, and out and out lies uh, as much as they can get away with it. This has uh, been my opinion for a long time. Why do I say that? What else are they truthful about? Not a whole lot. So I'm not really going to hold my breath and wait for the truth to come out on UAP, but they are obligated to attempt to do so. And we as citizens are obligated to hold their feet to the fire and make sure that they're doing this in its truthful way as we're able to figure out. Because you know what? We've got our own data. We have our own information to work off of. So again, I'm going to go over that with you. Uh, before I do this, one other thing I just want to share. I've been thinking about this in the course of uh, the book that I'm currently writing on USOs, that is water-based UFO phenomena. Um, what are the motives of these beings? Well, you know, we've wondered about them and we can continue to wonder about them. Uh, when I look back over uh, the broad sweep of evidence that I've seen over the last 30 plus years since I've been studying this, there's a few things that come to mind. These are five pretty obvious ones. You've got technological, biological experimentation, uh, some of these will come up in the cases I'm about to discuss with you. Observation and surveillance, resource acquisition, cultural and social manipulation, and finally, strategic positioning or colonization. All of these I will want to come back to and discuss more at length in the future. Uh, again, I think some of these motives, or let's say potential motives, are likely to come out in, uh, I've got 10 landing cases here that I want to show you now. I actually did a presentation on this at my website where I did, I think, 17 uh, UFO landing cases of the last quarter century of the 20th century, the last 25 years of the previous centuries, so like 1976 to 2000, uh, I did 17. I've culled the 10 that I, I think I like the most or that I think are the most uh, descriptive. And I'm sharing those here with you uh, with some other analysis. But actually, if you want the full thing, hey, join my website, become a member. We have an active community there over at richardallmembers.com. I'll link that below. Um, and the reason I, I wanted to look at some landing cases just lately is in this uh, current UAP disclosure situation that we're now dealing with. There's talk, for example, about further congressional hearings. Great. Um, but what I'm still not getting a lot from the public discussion is our history. We need the history. We need to understand that history so that we actually know what we are dealing with. And UFO landings are part of that history. There's you know, military encounters. I've talked about that many, many times. There's abductions. There's whole bunch of other things, water-based cases, yeah. But landings are another subset of the UFO subject that, again, they're tangible. They leave trace evidence frequently. Uh, sometimes they're quite dramatic and they happen more than people realize. So let's get into it. I'm gonna start with number one. I'm gonna go in order. So this is, um, um, I'm really gonna be talking about a, um, declassified New Mexico State Police report from 1976, June 13th, that detailed cattle mutilations and precise body part removal in connection with landed craft. So it's kind of an interesting thing. This one particular, I'm going to read it to you in a minute, but it describes how um, a craft appeared to have landed and uh, followed a cow around the field. And, um, well, good grief. Let, let me just read this to you. So uh, this is from a New Mexico State Police report from 1976. A suspected aircraft of some type had landed twice, leaving three pod marks positioned in a triangular shape. The diameter of each pod was 14 inches. The perimeter around the three pods was 16 and one half inches. Uh, illuminating, or excuse me, emanating from the two landings were smaller triangular shaped tripods, 28 inches and four inches in diameter, or excuse me, 25 inches and four inches. Investigation at the scene showed that these, the th these small tripods followed the cow for approximately 600 yards. That cow had to be very interested in getting away from this. That's, that's six football fields. 
Uh, the cow just was moving away from this. The small tripod tracks were all around the cow. There's much more to that. Uh, really quite fascinating. Um, we sometimes forget about the whole cattle mutilation or animal mutilation phenomenon. Uh, back in the mid, late 1970s, it was very much discussed and uh, was a very, very major topic of conversation in and beyond the UFO community. But here you have a, a case where I think a reasonable case can be made for the fact that this craft was involved in the uh, very nasty mutilation of a cow. Many of its body parts were cut off. I didn't get into those details here for you, but uh, with very, very precise, as always happens with these mutilations, very precise, um, unusually precise and almost, um, you know, ridiculously precise cuts in many cases, uh, frequently, which were shown to be done with um, high powered, apparently portable lasers that were um, well, very good at what they did. So anyway, that is one case. That's uh, a, um, a report that actually was covering a multitude of cases of animal mutilations, but in, in this one instance, it directly connected landing traces of a craft with a mutilation of a, of a cow. Let me do case number two. This is China, 1977. Uh, these cases, by the way, that I'm showing you are from all around the world. Uh, now this is, you know, the Chinese cases, this is just uh, right after the uh, the death of Chairman Mao Zedong. China was in a um, bit of tumult as a result of the political fallout from that. Um, but UFO reports began to be more and more discussed in China at around this time. There was an opening, a liberalization, you could actually say, following Mao. And uh, this is one instance you can see with the location on the map, basically facing Taiwan, uh, where this happened. And uh, let's just go right on. So you have in this Fukian province in China, uh, we don't have all the detail on this, but as it came out to the West, you had a silent, luminous object landing on a hilltop. You had 150 soldiers surrounding the hill. Captain orders them to hold fire. Uh, the, the soldiers apparently were getting very, very worked up. There was this um, sense um, that they were getting dizzy, that the, the, uh, the craft was somehow affecting them in a negative way and was causing uh, a sense of disorientation among the troops. Uh, they had to be restrained from firing at the object. The captain's thinking, is this some kind of American weapon that they maybe gave to Taiwan? And the Ta Taiwanese flew it across the straits here to, to mess with us. Uh, this is how they're thinking. Uh, the object became incredibly bright, apparently, um, and eventually it became such a problem for them that they did fire at this object. So you had a military exchange uh, to no effect. The object just lifted up, uh, made a noise. Not all of these objects make noises. This one apparently did. Uh, lit the entire area. Apparently this was at night. And then within, they said, 20 seconds, it was just gone. Uh, fascinating. Is it true? Well, uh, you know, the, the, the case the thing is with these, a lot of these cases with uh, communist countries in the 1970s and 80s or earlier, it is hard to know. Um, you know, communication with these societies is was not especially good. And could there be disinformation or could there just be mistakes that work their way into a report? Absolutely, it's always possible. But one thing I'll just say to you is when you go over these 10 cases that I'm uh, discussing with you, you might say, well, are all of them true? Maybe they're not all exactly how they purport to be, but then ask yourself, are all of them false? Are all of them just swing and a miss. I don't think so. Don't think so. I think uh, probably all of these are what they purport to be. I mean, if not all, then I would say definitely most. Uh, well, let's move on to Argentina. Uh, May 1st, 1979, town of Vizcacheras. Uh, you can see on a map here, it's kind of in the lower Andes. I think the altitude there is about three, 4,000 feet. Uh, so this is a very interesting case, and I'll just go over it here. Uh, with you, you've got, um, uh, oil fields known as the YPF oil fields. I think they're still going in this town of uh, Vizcacheras. The oil work is at 4 AM. They see an object. They actually try to communicate with this thing. They've got lanterns apparently, and 
according to what they said. Uh, by the way, this is written up in MUFON. I think I put the citation at the bottom of the slide there. If you have old copies of the MUFON journal, you can read this. Uh, they tried to signal to the UFO, and it apparently responded with blinking lights. This is something you get every once in a while in the literature. People try to communicate, flashlights with whatever, and or telepathically, you'll hear this type of a thing. And frequently enough, people will say, yeah, they, they answered us. Um, after the encounter, you had the object took off. It was it was somehow it just left. Uh, after the encounter, you have this uh, sand circle that was hardened. It was petrified. It was turned to like stone rock, I guess. Uh, it was found there. Uh, they took soil samples for analysis. Never really figured out what happened to those soil samples. Forgive me. I looked. I couldn't really see what the conclusion was. Now, there was a definite reaction of animals. There were lots of goats, over 1, 1,500, they said, that exhibited distress, and they would not return to their corral after the event. Uh, there was apparently a uranium mine nearby, and there is at least the suggestion that the object or objects, may have been others around there, were interested in the natural resources of that area. And again, this is something that one gets a lot in the uh, literature and the history. Uh, with uranium, there's a, there was a case of, uh, my goodness, of a UFO being seen over a South African uranium mine in 1952. Uh, and of course, we know in the United States, there were UFO encounters over nuclear uh, test sites and um, bases all throughout the 1940s and 50s and beyond. So I think there's definitely a connection there. And also, though, with other natural resources. So oil fields, absolutely. Um, this case that I've got here is probably the most famous of all uh, UFO landing cases, maybe of all of all time. This is the Bentwaters, a Rendlesham Forest case from December 1980. Of course, you've got uh, the RAF uh, base at Bentwaters, which was an American manned base. Uh, famously, you know, people saw a UFO flying overhead. Sometimes at first they thought it was a craft in distress and it goes, it seems to go down. Uh, U.S. Air Force servicemen are sent in. Uh, John Burroughs and Jim Penniston famously go into the woods to look for this object and they see it. Uh, Penniston actually touched the craft John Burroughs was very close by. This is uh, Pennison's drawing of it. I'll come back to it. So basically with th this case, it's often referred to as Britain's Roswell. No surprise, it's it's quite famous. So the the craft, as you can see with the, it, uh, the drawing, was very angular, somewhat triangular or pyramid shaped. Uh, Pennison actually touched it. Some years later said, you know, when I touched it, I had this like crazy flash, this telepathic download. Uh, some people did not believe him. Other people do believe him. Um, it's very interesting case. I, I think something obviously happened there. Uh, John Burroughs, who was watching this, uh, experienced se severe health problems in the aftermath of this. Um, this is a, a heck of a case. Uh, in the aftermath of this, over the next few days, there were more activities happening. Deputy base commander was Charles Colonel Charles Halt. He went out into the woods with a bunch of servicemen. He's recording what they saw. That's an amazing event. Um, lots of physical evidence left behind. And it's a great case. I mean, the Rendlesham, Bentwaters case, this object comes down. And, uh, and it's there. And someone actually touched that craft. So it's not many times when you, you know, when someone actually can say, yes, I touched a UFO, but uh, Sergeant Jim Penniston is one of those people. Uh, here's his drawing again, just so you can get a better look at it. Um, quite, quite interesting. So I've got a, a number of cases in the late 1980s from the Soviet Union or the USSR. Uh, a Krasnovodsk, Krasnovodsk um, which has now been renamed. It, this is in now modern day Turkmenistan, not, uh, not Russia, but this is all part of the Soviet Union at the time. That's the Caspian Sea that you can see there. Uh, this is a really interesting case. When you get to the last 
uh, several years of the existence of the Soviet Union, uh, something was going on here. Uh, there were way too many UFO reports that were just spilling out of the country. Uh, there are people arguing at the time uh, that this is all part of Soviet disinformation. I absolutely don't believe that whatsoever. Uh, there are just too many reports, too much evidence, too much mystified uh, reaction among the Soviet military and Soviet public. So in uh, Krasnovodsk, you have a case where this is there's a military installation there. You can see it's on the water, and radar tracks this large object, apparently spherical, at 20,000 meters. That's over 60,000 feet, very, very high up. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And they also track a smaller object that apparently came out of it, which descended and landed at what was called the Krasnovodsk spit. In other words, a small strip of land that just comes right out, like a little peninsula, essentially, but much smaller than an actual peninsula. Uh, the object lands on that. There's a flotilla of, of Soviet boats that are patrolling the area. They approach this object. This had to be a very dramatic moment. Um, they're about 100 meters away, and it uh, takes off. As it, when they get to within 100 meters, the object just uh, takes off it very rapidly, apparently. Uh, there's a heli at least one helicopter in the region as well, which tries to engage this object and apparently had no success whatsoever. Uh, this was investigated, we are told, by a military by the military special service. We'd, I do not know what the outcome was. And in researching this uh, a week ago, I, I saw that there was a, a similar incident in that exact region at the exact same city one year before. Uh, it wasn't a landing case, but it was some kind of attempted intercept apparently. Uh, some of the details on these are a little spotty, admittedly, when you're dealing with you know, an adversarial nation as the USSR back in the 1980s. It was still a communist, closed, uh, very controlled society. Information did not come out particularly easily. Uh, a lot of that changed when the Soviet Union ended in the early 90s, and a lot of the so-called KGB blue folder, uh, blue files came out. And, um, and here's another one. So this, I have a picture here of a Dr. Vladimir Avinsky. This man investigated uh, the case I'm about to describe to you, you can see on the map here, we're going well inland into the old USSR. This is still Russia, a city of called Samara. And so what ended up happening? This is nine, uh, September 13th, 1990. And uh, an incident in which you've got radar detection of an object and it, and it messes with the radar. I'll just say in my USO research, I have encountered a number of cases in which these objects have interfered with the communications and radar of American and Soviet ships out at sea. So here we have another instance of it happening on land. The, somehow the radar got malfunctioned and uh, observers were, were underground. They were down within a building. They come outside to see what's actually going on and they see this large uh, object. It's black, it's triangular, and it's giving off blue rays. Uh, it then lands. The rays were going straight up. It then lands and hit the radar antenna of the station, allegedly, I'm going to say allegedly here, with a ray that melted the thing, according to what they, um, what Avinsky uh, investigated. So uh, we have another situation where you have soldiers who are ready to fire at this object. Apparently there was a corporal by the name of Dudnik who said, nope, I'm not going to let you fire at this. Uh, at some point during this, this is a really wild case. You have two guards or sentries, they disappear and then reappear at, at some point later. They're not gone for very long, but they, they're taken and then they reappear. Uh, they have no memory of being taken, apparently. Uh, their watches had stopped. The uh, serial numbers on their weapons, uh, we're told, were erased as well. How and why that would happen, you got me, I don't know. Uh, there was a captain by the name of Rudzit who investigated this. He gets to a certain point and he is stopped by a chief air defense officer who says nothing happened. Uh, this whole thing was a non-event. Cease your investigation. Uh, Avinsky 
confirmed this incident. He wrote about it in a military newspaper called Red Star. And in fact, there's a, a clip of him on YouTube. Uh, I was able to find, and you can hear him talking uh, at length about this case. It's very interesting. I think uh, very compelling, if I may say. So the thing about these very bizarre uh, landing cases where there's beams being shot at people, they're paralyzed, they disappear. It seems extraordinary. It seems difficult to believe. I remember in my early years of studying this phenomenon, I did not want to acknowledge such cases like that. I just thought they were too crazy. They were too out there. Um, the problem with that attitude is there are many such cases like this. And I just felt like it's really not a good policy to just cherry pick the data that I personally think sounds credible to me. Uh, the, the phenomenon itself brings some very, very strange things with it. And, uh, you know, our job is to, to look at those things. We don't just accept them point blank, uh, absolutely. But we, I think it would be very unwise to ignore uh, particularly when they present a pattern. And in fact, that last case where soldiers disappeared and disoriented and watches stopped and the strange things happened, that's not unique. I think you we can all realize that's not a unique situation. So let's, uh, let's go on to the next case. Uh, this is in Peru now. I, there were quite a few others from the Soviet Union and from Russia, even post-Soviet Russia, that I could have included. And uh, just for time sake, I'm not going to get into those here. Uh, but this is an interesting case in Peru. We're talking January 31st, 1996. It's not that long ago. You know, it's less than 30 years ago. Uh, this is very high up. We're talking 12,000, 13,000 feet up in the Andes, very, very high altitude. Uh, and you have shepherds, local shepherds, they, they claim that they saw six objects and a larger mothership early in the morning descending and landing. I think the mother mothership landed. Maybe they all landed. Um, it was still very dark. And so they said the whole area was lit by intensely bright lights. Uh, and then they said two beings came out. They were very short, about a meter tall, basically a little over three feet tall. Uh, they had large heads. They had uh, wearing gray clothing of some sort. I uh, didn't get a great description of that. They come out of the large ship and they're collecting environmental samples, plants, soil, flowers, grass, water, uh, even algae, according to the, the witnesses. Uh, this went for 40 minutes. And then they went back into the craft, uh, which went straight up into the atmosphere, back up into space, and they were apparently all blown away. Um, there, these types of cases were reported quite a lot in the 1950s in Europe, uh, particularly France is best known for this in 1954. Uh, South America, however, back in the 50s also had such cases. You had cases like this reported in the 1960s as well in Europe, in the United States, um, and many other parts of the world where these beings, short little guys would come out, out of the craft, and they're taking soil samples, they're taking plant samples. Sometimes they're taking small animals uh, observed, you know, allegedly doing such things. So you've got these uh, rural folks way up in the Andes. Now, I'm gonna take a wild guess that it's, it wouldn't be impossible for them to know the history of UFO landing cases, but something just tells me that's probably not where these people were coming from. I think they saw what they claimed to have seen. That's what it seems like to me. Um, not everyone is always accurate with everything that they report. We understand that. But again, there's a pattern with a lot of these landing cases and encounter cases in general. So uh, let me continue. Another South American case around the same period of time. In fact, there's a few others from this region that I've, I've actually elected just to leave out. But I wanted to talk about this Brazil case in Santo Angelo. You can see it there on a map, southern part of Brazil. This one is uh, interesting. I think we're talking about two different landing cases successively. I don't think this was the same craft, although it could have been. I think it was two nights in a row. You've got, um, uh, there were two circles, they called them crop circles, that were left, basically landing traces. Uh, one witness named Claudette Parazzi, 
hears a noise. She sees a red light on her farm and she found a 10 meter, 30 plus foot diameter circle in her field the next day. She didn't really get a great look at the object, but that's what we have. Uh, there was another case where we have a security guard seeing what he called basically looking like an orange fireball. And he sees another uh, crop circle, let's just call it that. And he said there was white dust there. This was investigated by a local uh, UFO organization. Not sure what they determined. So it's a little frustrating when you, you come across these cases, you, you get the original thing. It's not always easy to get the follow-up. Uh, particularly if they're international, it's, uh, I think the due diligence isn't always there by, uh, the researchers, but I did find it an interesting case. Uh, I've got two more here for you. This was a South African case from 1998, December of that year in Bloemfontein. Uh, this is in what was called, what is called the orange free state. Uh, I've got it there on the map. Uh, this was reported in a local newspaper. So according to the paper, uh, which wrote this in early 1999. Uh, it was talking about some UFO events in the region. Uh, in this one in Bloemfontein, in December of 98, a farmer is out, he's driving a truck, his engine stops, it fails, and he is par paralyzed when he gets too close, apparently, to a landed UFO. Um, not much more uh, is described about that. At the same time, though, it was said that a farm worker experienced paralysis during the incident as well. So you had two individuals, apparently, who were there. Uh, the object leaves. The farmer then reports the event to the police. And uh, finally, I have this one here from Malaysia. Again, you know, we don't often hear of UFO cases outside the United States, but many of them do occur. This was a, a landing in March, March 2nd of 2000 in Kampung Gobek in Malaysia. You can see this is very close to the Strait of Malacca, one of the key shipping lanes of the world. A lot of action going on in that area in general. So here you have a situation where an object lands um, in a fairly rural area from what uh, it looked like. Villagers see this object. Uh, the light was described as incredibly bright, but intermittent. So it would be very bright and then not so bright and something like that. Um, when it gets lighter out and the object is gone, the villagers go there. They discover it. This is very interesting. A Y-shaped indentation and other marks. Apparently, they said very obvious ground traces and marks at the site. So uh, it, it looked to uh, everyone there that something very heavy had landed. So uh, this is not that long ago. We're talking this 25 years ago, 24 years ago. So now I want to talk about the potential um, motives and capabilities of these, of these beings. Uh, what are they trying to do? Um, so let me just pull up that slide. So capabilities, when you look at these types of landings and actually just based on these landings, but you can really extrapolate out to a lot of other, uh, UFO incidents. So you get various capabilities. One is advanced propulsion and hovering. Um, these craft have the ability to hover with precision they can make sudden controlled movements. Um, and many of these seem far beyond the human technology at the time or even current human technology. They seem to be able to overcome Earth's gravity with ease. Uh, also stealth and concealment. <clears throat> many of these incidents occur in remote areas or are only noticed due to their effects on the environment, which to me indicates that they can operate very discreetly. Uh, they have the ability to approach Earth's surface without detection frequently by conventional radar or surveillance. Uh, not always, but often that also suggests advanced stealth technology. You have environmental interaction, environmental sampling. Uh, you know, 
the physical traces left behind, like ground indentations, precise removal of specific body parts from cattle, uh, and other things like that, indicate to me that these beings have the technology to interact with and sample the environment and biological entities in a highly controlled manner. To me, this suggests a scientific interest in Earth's biosphere and very likely in humans and animals as biological specimens. Uh, there's also communication and signal transmission. So think about this. In some of these cases, you have witnesses reporting, receiving uh, like binary codes like Jim Penniston did at, at uh, Rendlesham or experiencing telepathic communication in some form or another, suggesting these beings possess advanced methods of communication. Uh, this could involve technology that directly interfaces with the human brain, or it could use... Uh, Maybe a universal mathematical language, if you think of binary code and something like that. But they have, they clearly, I would say, have advanced capability in these types of areas. Uh, fifth, there's temporal and spatial manipulation. That is time and space. Um, some of these encounters definitely suggest effects on time perception or physical space around the craft. Uh, to me, that indicates these beings have the ability probably, to manipulate space-time in ways that we don't really currently understand. Um, and I think that could explain sometimes the sudden appearance or sudden disappearance of craft and the reported time loss sometimes that you get by witnesses. Just saying. Uh, next, biological protection or biological enhancement. The beings are often described as wearing suits. They're wearing helmets. Um Sometimes they are, I should say, and this frequently suggesting they might use protective gear to shield themselves from Earth's environment, or possibly uh, these suits enhance their biological capabilities. Hey, you never know. Uh, to me, this indicates an understanding of bioengineering, or at least the need to protect against environmental hazards. May sound kind of basic, but it's just worth noting. Um, another one to keep in mind is capabilities, energy manipulation. You think about this. They can cause electronic interference. They can cause vehicle malfunctions or even temporary paralysis in witnesses. So all of these things suggest that these craft and the beings operating them can manipulate energy fields or electromagnetic radiation in targeted ways. Uh, this, cap this could be used for defense, this could be used for communication, this could be used for environmental interaction, probably a lot of other things. And finally, I'm just writing here for the capabilities, uh, let's say non-invasive examination techniques is one way to put it. So um, you've got these encounters that involve frequently, not always, but non-harmful examination of humans, um, which suggests that these beings have very sophisticated medical or scanning technologies probably able to perform diagnostics or collect data without invasive procedures, I would say. Um, I infer these capabilities. I not, you know, let me get off this uh, screen here. There we go. Uh, I'm inferring these capabilities. I'm not saying, yes, absolutely. This is what it seems like to me. And I would say they highlight a very definite level of technological advancement that seems to ex greatly exceed our current human capabilities. Um, now, as far as motives, the motives behind these landings and the interactions, that's also speculative. But I would say there's some suggestions here uh, with combinations of uh, scientific research, um, with uh, reconnaissance and so forth. I mean, so scientific study, biological sampling, uh, you think of the precision in the cattle mutilations or the collection of environmental samples. To me, that suggests a motive of scientific study. Um, they could be con conducting a comprehensive survey of Earth's biological diversity or of our environmental conditions, poss possibly monitoring changes over time. Um, I've heard the skeptics occasionally say, why would aliens fly around on these big clunky spaceships when they can probably, you know, with advanced tech, you have a nano size of something like the grain of rice that could be highly intelligent and, uh, and zip around and you'd never notice it. 
That may be true, but uh, a sample the size of a grain of rice is not going to be able to collect biological samples from Earth. It's not going to be able to take plants or little animals or, you know, soil samples and things like that. You actually need something large for that. Uh, and if you are interested in the actual physical uh, doings of planet Earth, you might need something that's a little bit larger than a grain of rice, just saying. So I think that's um, something to keep in mind. Let me just continue with this list here. Uh, reconnaissance and surveillance. That seems to be pretty obvious. you got the interest in military bases. Many of them. Many I haven't even mentioned here. Um, and other strategic locations, I would say, indicate a motive of reconnaissance monitoring. Uh, I would not be shocked if these beings are just gathering intelligence on human military capabilities, technological advances, advances strategic interests. I mean, think of this. If you're an alien coming from another world, you come to Earth. It's post-World War II. Uh, you see that these humans have got nuclear weapons all of a sudden, like brand new, and they really love detonating these massive nuclear devices all through the 1950s and 60s. I mean, my God, you might be thinking, okay, I got to keep an eye on these, on these beings. They are, they are not trivial now. When you got nuclear weapons, that's not trivial. We may have more power, we may have more this and that, but they still have nukes. Uh, that is definitely something we want to monitor along with all the other reasons that we are here. So just a thought. Uh, also, technological testing and experimentation. Just a thought. You got the, the landing and the hovering behaviors along with interactions with the physical environment. I wonder, would this suggest a technological testing or experimentation? In other words, are they assessing the performance of their craft under different conditions? Are they experimenting with the effects of their technology on the Earth's environment and its inhabitants? It's not something I hear uh, very frequently, but it does come to my mind when I look at some of these cases. Again, the key is when we are looking at landing cases or we're looking at any kind of interaction, the thing that I think we want to do is we want to try to do our best get inside the head, the oversized big heads of these aliens and think for them to the extent that we can. We're probably not going to get it right, but at least let's put ourselves in their position and think if I were them, what would I want to be doing? What would be my motives for being here? What would be my motives for this particular UFO interaction that this witness described? What's actually going on? A lot of these UFO encounters seem baffling and some of them, even after you really look at them for a long time, they do remain baffling. They don't all easily make sense. But I do think it's incumbent on us, for those of us who are students of this, to try. We want to think this through and ask ourselves, what is actually going on here? Um, another thing that comes up when I'm looking at these cases here that I've just described with you, uh, cultural or sociological study. What do I mean? The encounters with humans resulting in experiences of uh, paralysis and other types of effects could, I'm just putting this out there, indicate an interest in human physiology, human uh, psychology, uh, maybe even sociological structures for all I know. They, they might be studying human responses to unfamiliar stimuli as part of a broader investigation into human society and human culture. Now, I do think that there are other things going on with the UFO phenomenon um, that are not all indicated in landing cases. Is there uh, the possibility, as I suggested um, early on, of uh, strategic positioning and colonization? Um, I would say yes. Um, you, you think about whether you've got the construction of, let's say, alleged underground bases or alleged collaboration with certain human power structures. You hear rumors of this type of thing over and over again. Is it true? Of course it could be true. It, it, it could absolutely be true. I don't know for an absolute fact, but we've had uh, claim after claim for decades of this type of thing. If that is the case, you have uh, a motive of strategic positioning on Earth, uh, possibly as a precursor to something else. Colonization, 
permanent presence for some unknown purposes. If you've got the long-term presence of other beings that are here, uh, you have to consider the possibility that they want to be here for an even longer period of time after that, obviously. Um, anyway, there's a lot of other types of motivations that we uh, can consider with these objects. But when you look at the landing cases of simply the last quarter century of the 20th century, I think a number of these capabilities and potential motives come to bo come to bear. So uh, something to keep in mind. Again, to reiterate, the UFO, and I'm going to say UFO here, not UAP in this case, the UFO phenomenon is very important to us for a whole bunch of reasons, not all directly related to getting UAP disclosure. The disclosure is a good thing. We want that. But the fact is this subject offers vastly so much more than just issues of disclosure that it is, I think, very much worth our while to study it. Uh, I think a little bit of effort is easily repaid in the benefits that you get just from thinking of a difficult subject in a uh, hopefully in a creative way and and coming up with some ideas that you may not have had previously. Uh, the UFO subject has done that for me for 30 years, I can tell you. It's the biggest surprise of my life. It continues. Uh, it doesn't stop after all these years. I find myself, I'm continually learning more and more about this incredible phenomenon. So don't despair. Disclosure may not happen this week. It may not happen this year. Probably won't happen this year. That's no reason to throw up your hands in disgust and say a pox on you. Uh, the phenomenon is important. It remains important. And by, by the way, last thing I'll just say here before I uh, sign off, the every time uh, U.S. government entities or any other government entity for that matter says, well, there's no evidence of this phenomenon being anything important. We just had the Arrow report a couple of months ago saying the same thing. Uh, well, this has been going on for a long time. And the thing is, the operators of those craft never seem to get the memo that they're not supposed to exist. They keep operating. So no matter how many years go by and the government doesn't give us the transparency that we want or the government denies this over and over, has no effect on the phenomenon itself. The phenomenon continues the phenomenon abides, as we would say in the Big Lebowski, right? The phenomenon abides. So uh, anyway, these are issues that I think are engaging. They're important. We don't want to lose sight over the fact that even in our very recent history, and I should do uh, a follow-up on the, the last 25 years of UFO landing cases. I just started at a, on a whim. I was looking up the late 20th century, but Absolutely, there are cases in the 21st century. So I'd like to come back and maybe do a, um, a program on that as well. But the fact is, these cases that I've just reviewed, they're not that long ago. You know, many of the folks that dealt with them back then, they're still alive. They're still around. Uh, these objects are seen around the world. They are landing around the world. Something important is happening. And it's worth our time you care to put the time into studying it, understanding it, well, it's a very worthwhile thing to go into. And I encourage you. I encourage all of you who are inclined to be serious students of this phenomenon to go ahead and do it, pursue it. Uh, don't expect that you're going to make a living doing it. If you can, more power to you. But if you want to set aside the time to pursue this in a serious way, I say do it. You could do a lot worse. Uh, it's a fascinating subject that opens up just so many, so many fascinating questions. So there you go. Um, I, if you like what I have here, do hit the like button, hit notifications, subscribe to my channel. You know what to do. Do check out my website at richarddolanmembers.com. I want to thank all of you for your support uh, on this channel over these years. I'm not always here every week. I know you realize that. Some, some folks would be like, why isn't Dolan out there every week or every day or whatever doing this? It's difficult uh, for me to do a regular YouTube channel. Look, I, I do my best. Uh, I try to write my books. I try to do many, many other things. And YouTube, sometimes I have to admit, 
takes a little bit of a back seat, but it's always there. I won't be leaving YouTube. I do expect to be back again soon with another program. Uh, and I always look forward to them and I always enjoy doing these with you. So I do hope to see you again in the future. In the meantime, let's keep fighting the good fight. Catch you all later. Bye for now.